Hello, Todd. It is nice meeting you in this digital uh, format. Um, today we want to discuss about the 2500 liter orbital shaker from the Kulina company and the successfully integrated disposable bag of the company Integris. And we were at a lot of trade fair shows and conferences and we got a lot of questions regarding the bag and also about our orbital shaken bioreactor. And therefore we decided to have this discussion round here with experts uh, to answer these questions. Uh, my name is Tibor Anderley. I'm the CSO of the company Kühner Shaker. And I'm joined by my two colleagues. One is Tarsika Tamakula Singam. She is the product manager of the orbital shaken bioreactors from the Kühner AG. And then I'm joined by Dave Lettler. He's the CEO of our uh, Kühner company in the US. Todd, would you be so kind and introduce your team and of course yourself and your company? Great. Well, thank you, Tibor. We, it's a pleasure being able to speak with you and your team today as well. So as you mentioned, I'm Todd Cap. I'm the commercial director globally for Integris Life Science. Is. And I have also with me today, uh, Kurt Christofferson, who's our engineering and applications manager for life sciences, and Donnie Beers, our senior product manager for life sciences on the phone as well. And we're very excited to, to speak with you today about um, the large volume bioreactor bag assembly that we provide to you. And I think it's going to be a bit of a surprise to a lot of the audience that this is a product that Integris manufacturers because they probably are more familiar with our Aramis bag, but I think they'll be excited to learn a lot more about what we have to offer. So thank you again, Timor, for, for having us. Before I pass it on to Dave, uh, I just want to uh, shortly introduce also the company Kühner AG. Uh, Kühner is a company producing incubator shakers um, and we distribute them worldwide. And we started with the production of the incubator shaker 70 years ago. And since 10 years, we are providing the orbital shaken bioreactors to the market. And now, Dave, it's your turn. Please do the introduction to the discussion round. Thank you, Tibor and Chad. Um, I believe we all agree that it might make sense to break today's conversation into three different sections. And maybe we can just start with the what might be the simplest, although from our perspective, things are easy and yours, they might not be. Um, and I think we can talk about bioreactor logistics. So manufacture the bioreactor, handling and shipping that product to the customer. Next, we can probably go a layer deeper and talk specifically about the film. So extractables, leachables, materials, and things that come into product contact that I'm sure those watching would be interested to learn more about. And finally, maybe we can have a conversation about life cycle. So not only the cost life cycle, but also the environmental impact and the total total value life cycle. So if, if that makes sense to everyone, um, maybe we can get started with the first topic, which would be the handling and logistics of such a large bioreactor. So for Kuhner Shaker, we're, we have the luxury that our bioreactors are steel. Our, our shaker incubators are made of steel with glass, electronics, things that are easy to control. But from Integris' perspective, our perception is that these things are a little bit more difficult to manufacture. And, and so we're curious, are there really big challenges that you face producing a 2,500 liter disposable bioreactor? Yeah, Dave, I'll uh, take that one. A 2,500 liter bioreactor is a lot different than making say a 50 or 100 liter size reactor because the footprint of the reactor is so large and you have so much material you have to first be able to produce that film and then you need to be able to package the bioreactor so it can be gamma irradiated so it'll be sterile as a closed system coming and 
being sent to a customer. So there's quite a few challenges, especially in the packaging, in the way that that can be folded and uh, placed into the uh, packaging for gamma radiation. And then also on the customer's end, when they receive that and loading the bioreactor into a, uh, or the bag part into the 2,500 liter Kuhner Shaker bioreactor, uh, there's quite a few uh, technical parts and portions that go into that. So you not only have to produce the product, but you also have to assure that you're packing it correctly. Uh, I'm guessing there's extra materials going into that that are needed just to prevent layers from rubbing. Is, is that part of the problem? Yeah, there? That, that's true. Because when you make a, a reactor of this size, you have lots of large uh, Fittings that go on there that have sharp corners. You have several filters that are on the, the bioreactor itself. You have different type of sensors. And so when you're folding and packaging that, it's a key to make sure that you don't get any puncture because it, even though the film is very robust, it is still plastic. And so you have to make sure uh, everything is uh, packaged in a way that will make it uh, very easy for the customer to be able to open up and put into the large uh, scale outer housing of the reactor. And so, yeah, there's quite a dif quite a different a variety of uh, processes that we go through to make that so that it is a function. And so, it, with with all the steps that are required, Kuhner, when we send a bioreactor to a customer, uh, we can do an FAT. So customers uh, allowed to come on site to Kuhner and do the factory acceptance test with us. And then there's often an SAT or site acceptance test. And those two tests help us assure that we deliver exactly what we've uh, promised to the customer. Are there similar tests that you have to do at Integris or something like this? I mean, it's, it's a plastic, it's a malleable product. How do you know that the customer is going to get what you're sending out of your factory? Okay, that, that's a good question. Um, basically, so we have to take one of these 2,500 liter reactors and we have to do integrity testing on the chamber, which is it has a very large footprint, but we've uh, come up with a way that we can uh, fill that and do a pressure decay so that we know that we're sending uh, an integrity tested uh, product to the customer. Mm -hmm. And then there's all kinds of different things that we look at at the film properties, tensile strength testing that we do on the each run on each bag to ensure that uh, those properties are met. So there, there's lots of different things that we have to do to make that fit. Each bag has to be inflated, is that, do I understand that correctly? That is correct. So imagine how large this 2,500 liter uh, uh, package is, and we have to inflate that and uh, make sure that it uh, passes the, the quality exams that we have to do to it. So yes, that's very large. It takes up a large section of the uh, of the clean room when we have to do that because of the footprint size. But we are able to do that. It's something that we've done in the past and will continue to do so that we can send a reliable uh, product to the customer and they can look at that testing and uh, know that we're in good shape with that. Mm -hmm. And maybe I have a question. How do we assure that we have reproducible product every time? So, yeah, as you mentioned, you that you have the quality and how you can um, confirm this. Um, well, it, it's confirmed, Tarsica, through uh, the fact that we have uh, procedures that we follow and we have drawings that we follow. We do CGMP manufacturing at our site here in Logan. So we, we have the regulatory aspect of it set up to follow our uh, quality regulations. Mm -hmm. And then we actually do a visual inspection on each of the, the products as they are put together to make sure that they're, they're following the drawing and the design that was put together. But uh, yeah, it, it is very... Uh, very important that we make the same product, a reliable product time after time. And for example, since we're talking kind of about the films here, we do a continuous heat seal process. So we know when the, the equipment at the beginning of each shift is brought up to a certain temperature and that temperature is maintained throughout the day, throughout the processing. And that's uh, verified and, and checked by uh, several different ways. But with the continuous heat, we know that we're uh, uh, getting the same reliable seal every time that we seal, rather um, than doing like an impulse seal. 
That's really interesting. And maybe I have another question. So in our bioreactor bags, we don't have any um, impeller. So is this an advantage um, that there's no impeller integrated for the production of the bags? Yes, that, that's very interesting. A lot of uh, reactors out there do have an impeller, kind of the stir tank, mm -hmm. and not having the impeller makes it very more efficient to be able to manufacture the bags with assembly part of it, which is large one-inch diameter tubing, uh, 10, 20-inch filters, uh, lots of different sensors. And so with all these tubings and parts, we're able to fold the bag in such a way that it can be put in to the box to be sent for gamma irradiation. And so that packaging is very much better by not having the impeller inside. And I know there's lots of other things that are uh, better with not having the impeller in the reactor itself, which uh, you guys uh, know about, and we could talk about that a little bit. But uh, yes, it's very helpful. Of course, if you do not have an impeller, in a, in a bag, it is much better because an impeller is resulting in a very high local shear stress. And this is not good for the cell cultivations because this could damage the cells. And therefore, we are lucky we do not have an impeller or we do not need an impeller. And that is a huge advantage for our customer. And because we have customers who have mammalian cells, and also, for example, stem cells, which are shear sensitive. And that is a huge advantage of the orbital shaken bioreactor. The other thing that I just wanted to add to that is, is you do the setup into the reactor, it is a lot easier to not have the impeller. I have another question, Kurt. Of course, I, I know, for example, that in the smaller scale, we have standard connectors. Uh, we have standard uh, sterile couplings and stuff like that. Uh, and you can even use uh, a tube welder for doing sterile uh, weldings. How that is how that is happening with a larger scale bioreactor? Is tube welding, for example, possible? Are there totally different connectors? So the one thing that's great about this is we use the same materials, whether we start on a 100 liter, 200 liter size up to the 2500 liter size. So uh, being able to scale is, is uh, it makes sense and it's easily doable. But yes, as you've talked about, the filters are larger, uh, sensors, there may be more sensors needed, different place of sensors. Tubing size uh, is generally larger than one inch on several, needed for several of the applications. And so, yes, it is possible to go larger. Uh, we've gone from inch up to inch and a half on some of these reactors for the OD. And so we are able to tube weld, that is possible to tube weld. And there's lots of different uh, aseptic uh, connecting devices on the market today that we're able to use for these reactors. So yes, it is possible to uh, go up to the large size and we have to determine all of those in our design space for putting this together. And I, I wasn't involved with the initial relationship building between Integris and Cooner, but I believe that's one of the things that really attracted us to your teams is your flexibility. and. And piggybacking on, on TWAR's comment about the, the customers and, and uh, their applications and being able to address their needs, we have so many times a request for a very specific new type of fitting to go into the bag. I, I believe that your team is equally capable at getting those into the final product so the customer can have what they need for their process. Uh, am I right in that? Yeah, you're right? correct. We do, uh, we do customization within our standard toolboxes, but we also can do customization outside of our standard toolboxes in which the 2500 liter uh, requires some customization outside of our uh, standard toolbox of parts and pieces. And so we're able, one of the things that makes us unique and that we can really help with on uh, these large size projects is we can place the ports wherever we need to on the bag. We're not limited to putting them just in one spot or just at the top. So in this case, as complicated as your design is, we've been able to work with you and simplify that by putting uh, different sensors and ports where needed on the bag. So, and every customer is not the same. 
we definitely need different parts, pieces, connectors, and sensors, and we are able to supply those onto the onto the bag configuration. So we're very much set up to and willing to be able to help the end user working with you guys on what their end treatments and sensors uh, builders are on the on these assemblies. Yeah, and I think I'd like to add on that. Taking a look at the the, the pressures in the market right now. There's an extreme pressure on on our customers um, to to rationalize their their supply chains, uh, you know, reduce the number of vendors, reduce the number of SKUs that they're bringing into their their footprint. So that works to a point, but there are specific needs for particular applications where it does make sense to differentiate those products and make sure you're getting something that's not going to require additional parts and pieces to integrate. So. Taking a look at that, we've adopted an approach that yes, we can produce standard off the shelf products. We also have a level of, of configuration around those themes, right? So one part number can branch into several different motifs to make sure that those customers can reduce their number of SKUs they're bringing into the supply chain, you know, logistics, inventory, et cetera, but then also making sure they get the specific things they need. And then above and beyond that, um, you know, customization is, is one of our specialties. It's something that we bring as a value add to our customers. They need something, you know, new to world or I've got this idea. Can you help me? Can you help me figure it out? Right. That's that's something that we really specialize in. And I think, um, you know, Cooner and, and Integris together have kind of felt the benefit of that. You guys are, are bringing something, you know, slightly different to the market that has some very nice differentiation. And then and, and there's some good synergy there. So. It, it kind of goes both ways. Couldn't agree more. Uh, I feel we've covered most of uh, the simple logistics and, and assembly and delivery to the customer. Does anyone want to add some final things before we jumped on to the next topic? Yeah, one other thing I just would mention is uh, the sterilization, which is done by uh, gamma irradiation, uh, being the different irradiators that are facilities that are available throughout uh uh, the industry being able to fit that into their type of uh, box they it is needed to go into their carriers so that you can get a sterility assurance level needed is uh, somewhat unique and so uh, that's one thing that really is important that we've been able to do working with you guys to get that packaging configuration done so that kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier uh, we have a lot of unique uh, capabilities between the two companies that we can do that maybe some others in the industry are having a would have a little bit more difficult time with. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the physical layout must be one thing. Materials compatibility must be a whole new challenge or beast um, to assure that everything's going to respond correctly to the irradiation without changing, deforming, or or losing the, some of the properties which we need out of those materials. Uh, pretty complex stuff, I imagine. Yeah, it, it is, and it's uh, we got a good team of people to help us with that, though, so that's good. I think on the topic of logistics that we would want to mm -hmm. also illustrate, um, Integris is a global company, and we've developed a global supply chain so that it's very robust to make sure that the critical thing is, is that your customers have to be able to have the product when the time that they need in order to do their production run or their lab trial, things of that nature, and if there's any delay in providing you with the product, it could potentially shut them down and not have them be able to produce these critical treatments. So we've been able to leverage the strength of Integris globally. Um, with our, our strong logistics supply, we actually saw what the effects of COVID were going to be before most of the market did because of our, our ties over in Asia with where we're doing production. So as soon as we noticed that something like that was going to occur, our CEO and our supply chain already put things in place to make sure that we would be able to continue continuity of supply to our customers during that time. And so because of the fact that we are, are very um, cognizant of what is going on from the global logistics standpoint, we did not shut down any of our customers during that period of time and plan not to do so in the future and put things in place to make sure that we have that security of supply that's so critical for this marketplace.
Yeah, absolutely. And and COVID being um, an unfortunate but very real world stress test of the ability to deploy, deploy and, and uh, manufacture these types of consumables during a time when global supply chains were turned completely upside down and diversion of plastics to, at this point, PPE and other uh, uh, hospital and, and uh, other associated products would potentially be a real risk factor, I would suppose, for someone who's running a bioreactor needing to manufacture something. So it's an interesting set of challenges that your team faced. And uh, it's nice to hear that you have such depth and also some foresight and feelers out there to get a sense of what's going on and be able to respond quickly. And, and the supply chain, Todd, was a, a, a nice uh, part of, of this next conversation because we have uh, a topic we'd like to cover on materials of construction, uh, the certifications that go into the bag. So getting more specific now, uh, we talked about assembly and, and some of the details needed for delivery to the customer, but now maybe we can discuss the films themselves, uh, what considerations are made so we can report extractables and leachables to our users. And then there might be more things that we want to elaborate on for supply chain security. Um, certainly, Cooner faces those pressures as well. We're required to deliver machines in a GMP. And when our partners need an instrument for GMP, they get their instrument for GMP. There's no other option available to us. So we know you face the same pressures. Um, so with that, I don't know. I think Parsec is probably going to have more mm -hmm. questions here than I will. Uh, which would be refreshing for everyone. Sure. But Tarska, do you want to get us started? Yeah, I would like to start. Um, so before that, we talked about um, about customized bags. So you, we can offer our customers customized bag for their needs. And um, so, but does this change um, a lot of in the costs of them? So do the customer have to pay a lot more if they have? with some special wishes? Yeah, I think what's what's important to consider when you're talking about um, customization or configuration for a particular application is is really the, the total cost of ownership. Um, so there may be some, some synergies to having a, a standardized design that you can get quickly. Um, but if you can get that, that configured assembly that's exactly right for your application and it arrives on time with consistent security of supply, that the value that you're getting there, uh, it's, it's going to be a marginal uh, cost increase. But for the value that you're gonna get in your application, not needing additional adapters, aseptic connectors, you easily just by incorporating that configured design to not have parts and pieces or not have you know, homebrewn uh, um, jumpers or other things to make one manufacturer's component talk to another manufacturer's component or, or make sure you don't introduce leaks or any vulnerabilities in that. Having all the parts and pieces that you need for the whole application right there in one kit delivered to you together, that's that's gonna result in way higher payback in terms of reducing out of specifications and, and delays. And then when you're getting those components from multiple manufacturers, it also adds another level of, of supply chain complexity that you're not really focusing on. When you're thinking, oh, I need to reduce my number of suppliers and I need to have standard designs, but you're still buying multiple components from multiple suppliers to make that work. So you're going to get way more value if, if you do get the configured design that's, that's exactly right for your application. Well, part of the reason why Cooner sought out Integris is, if I'm not mistaken, you guys were running into a supply constraint or material constructions for what you needed for your large volume bioreactors was not being available. You needed to find somebody that could actually be dependable, deliver the product because you were in a situation where you had a customer that was starting to ramp up production um, in your large bioreactors, but the supply constraints from other suppliers were such that it was putting you in a bind. Um, because of not only did, were we able to address your concerns with getting large volume bioreactors like this for the containers, uh, we also were able to even improve upon the design, or, or I believe that Cooner has had the opportunity to see some additional benefit out of the design that our team came up with in order to 
um, reap some additional performance benefits beyond just what you saw for supply chain. Is that correct? Uh, Tot that is totally correct. Yeah. So we uh, we run a mechanical stress test on your bag, and I think over 100 days, and it worked. And that was the best sign for us to work with you together on the 2,500 liter scale. I know that our team was really surprised to find a partner like Integris who could respond with the speed at which you responded and further deliver a bag that far outperformed what we were previously using. So uh, it was a real slam dunk and, and uh, really launched and catapulted this relationship to where it is now. Uh, really a nice, nice job. The, the contact layers themselves, I don't know if Tarsic is going to ask about that, but I'd sure like to hear. I'm sure there's a viewer who would like to know specifically what our contact layers are. And maybe I can throw a new one in here as well. Um, with the way that this bag is constructed, are there particular things we have to be uh, careful of? Or, or how do you address the multi layer construction when you have a port going through it? Like, how, how do you do it? Uh, I can't quite wrap my head around it. Okay, uh, good question. I'll talk for just a minute and uh, about the design of the bag and the film material. So we're a little bit unique, especially on this uh, this larger chamber. We actually use a blown film, and so a blown film doesn't require any side seams. So uh, imagine the film; it's blown in a round shape. And then we gusset the sides of the film. So we, we basically use two different layers. We have the inner layer, which is a polyethylene uh, film. It's a virgin film, so there's no additives to it. It's very inert. And then our outer layer is a polyethylene. And then we have nylon, which provides the tensile strength. And then we have EVOH, which provides the gas barrier. And then we have a, another PE layer to that. So basically, you have this large piece of blown film that's been gusseted, which is the inner layer. And it, it, when we manufacture it, it is slid inside of this outer layer. So right away, there's no common seams on the side of the bag of the chamber. And then on the top and bottom, uh, we use a sealer that comes down and seals that. So the only... Uh, uh, common seams are on the top of the bag. Now, you asked also uh, if we put a port through it. So we weld a port th through all layers of the bag. So that is common where the, where the port goes through, and it's common on the top and bottom seams, but it is not common anywhere else in the bag. So that gives us a, a reliability if for some reason there was a, a failure or whatever uh, on the inner layer, it would be caught in the outer layer, and the product would still be sterile. And you can see how important that would be, especially on a 2,500 liter uh, bioreactor with the price of the material uh, that's inside of that that's being used. So it, it works very well with the blown film. We can shape that to fit into these large size reactors. And uh, so we have a set circumference, and then it's easy for us to change the length. If, say, you go up to a 3,000 liter or a 4,000 liter reactor in the future, we just, uh, we just change the length of it of the uh of the chamber itself so not saying we're going you're going there yet or making a new product but uh uh with these materials that we have we are capable of of making uh the needed changes to that Tiber, a quick follow-on question you mentioned that you saw that our bag performed at 100 days how does that compare to what your customers need i mean are they running cycles that long or and and are the is it meet the customer expectation or how does that also compare to other things you might have been using before? What kind of period of time were they, they lasting for? In the moment, in this larger scale, uh, our bioreactor are run in a fat batch mode and in a batch mode. And here, uh, the running time is around 14 days or maybe 20 days, I would say, yeah? uh, because we are in the field of cell cultivation. But... Uh, there's more going on, and that is the perfusion technology. And with the perfusion technology, you can run your system much longer. And uh, yes, uh, there are uh, customers who plan to run for 
90 days uh, by reactor. So yes, uh, this 100 days, which I mentioned, would uh, uh, yeah would be good for our customer and enough for our customers. Yeah, I think it also just speaks to the durability, um, knowing that we're never going to come close to what our stress test was able to achieve when we're running a live product, a uh, uh, real production. I think that just gives a, an added layer of comfort. We're going to be so far within the the window that it will never be a question for the for the end user. You're going to load that into a GMP facility and run uh, a very costly as far as time and also monetary value bioreactor. You don't want to be anywhere near the danger zone. And knowing that we're able to extend that run way out if we had to, uh, just takes that off the table as a concern for those who are running these these very intense bioreactors. Mm -hmm. So our missions are not in direct contact with our product, so our culture, but the bags are. So therefore, a, lot, a customer always requests leachables and extractable studies. So do you provide um, these kind of studies? Yeah, it's a really important question. So as the industry moves more and more from, from stainless steel, large scale manufacturing capability to single use, the burden of the, the validation of what's getting into the product shifts from the from the customer to the to the supplier. So it's it's a it's a thing that we take very seriously at, at Integris. And one of the things that, that's important to consider is what components you're putting into that. We use a variety of, of industry standard components that have uh, well-established leachables and extractables profiles. In addition to that, we um, we use the the, the BPOG and BPSA guidance to uh, our approach to to leachables and extractables. And one of the one of the key things is always going to be a, a, a risk-based approach. So, what are the most critical? What are the longest duration um, contact layers? Or what are the, the maybe the new or the different components that are being put into these these um, these assemblies? So yeah, high surface area, longest contact time, and and, um, and new components are where we focus. And we've got a group of, of experts that can help collaboratively work with with Kuner, with with Kuner's customers, with Integris's customers to ensure that we're we're making sure they have everything they need for integration into their CGMP manufacturing environment. So. We have a history of, of working within these these trade organizations, and it's something that we want to stay at the forefront of. We know leachables and extractables is becoming more and more front and center, and there's there's higher and higher expectations for quality for single use uh, components. So that's where we want to be. Before that, we talked about the integrity test. Do you also offer different kind of tests? Yeah, I'll, I'll just answer at, at a, a kind of a superficial level and then we'll, we'll pass it over to Kurt. So all of our products are, are tested to industry expectation and, you know, above and beyond industry expectation, we're, we're, we're looking at our customer requirements and making sure it's fit for purpose. We have a wide range of, of products that we supply all the way in the super downstream, as well as, you know, critical bioreactor applications. So they're, they're tested to the application. Um, you know, in terms of specific tests, we, we talked a little bit about the, the, the large scale inflation uh, um, integrity test that we do for these products. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it over to Kurt and we can talk a little bit more about the specific tests for the, uh, the Kuhner Bioreactor bag. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, we talked about the inflation test that we do that, that's critical. But the way most of the testing that we do with it is we've validated our process for, for making these large scale reactors or any other uh, product that we make. I talked about the continuous heat sealer. So that is checked uh, every time we make something, all of those different processes. So we build within a validated process. And building within a validated process allows us to just do a visual inspection and then do the testing that we talked about with the inflation test. So the key to what we do in our uh, in our manufacturing is having a validated processes and following those validated processes for the manufacturing aspect and using as we've talked before all of the different parts and pieces that go into that into uh an approved uh 
approved parts and systems so we know exactly what we're getting uh, on the end product throughput after manufacturing. And I think Chris, you want to talk just a just a little bit about you know your integrity, uh, excuse me, endotoxin testing and and um, sterility assurance testing that we conduct. With yes, uh, good question. So uh, that is done on a periodic basis, uh, especially for the gamma irradiation uh, sterilization. We follow the Amy uh, guidelines, uh, VD Max method. So all of the parts and pieces that go into this assembly uh, on a quarterly basis are are tested to make sure that we do have a, a sterile product. So uh, that's a that's a very good point. Uh, all of the the things that are required from a regulatory process, uh, we go through and uh, can show that uh, we've done that testing so that we can send a, a complete uh, validated package to the end user with the uh, with the assembly. That's great. Mm -hmm. I think the other aspect that we have to consider as to why are why are your customers asking you for that kind of compliance. And it comes back to this paradigm shift with why would you put a single use bag inside of the bioreactor? And I think you found that they're used to doing SIP, CIP, which uses a tremendous amount of water um, and really hits into the, the ecosystems uh, of the industry. But then also the fact that there's a possibility, did you get it clean enough when you go do your next batch so you wouldn't have cross-contamination? And I think a lot of the value that Cooner and Integris are offering the marketplace for these larger scale is we've eliminated that need for SIP, CIP cleaning in place. But in order to substitute for that, we have to demonstrate that the products that we're providing you in there are not going to leach any product into affect your uh, bioreactor process, things of that nature. So that's why we've taken it so seriously to make sure that we have the strong validation package available on our products so that you can give your customers the assurance that it's not going to impact the way that they process their products in this system. And I, I'm guessing, uh, Todd or, or Donnie, I'm using these materials that are likely even more stringent than the ones that we use for our bioreactor, or not materials, but requirements. So. I think when we opened up, you mentioned that you're delivering uh, uh, films or materials that are used for manufacture or shipping of the COVID vaccine. So you have now products going direct into humans. And the specifications, I'm just making an assumption here, must be higher for those than they even are for our bioreactors, which are, of course, quite high themselves. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So this is one of the things that, that Integris really brings to the, the life sciences industry is... Um, we have a history of delivering high purity materials into the semiconductor um, industry. And one of the really cool things is that we can detect particulates that are, that are orders of magnitude higher than, than what is necessarily for the biopharmaceutical industry. And, you know, Integris is a very customer centric or organization that, that also, you know, quality is, is, a, is a high focus. And when we're delivering our, our Aramis product, which is which is positioned into um, reason thaw for bulk drugs substance, um, it's designed to be a very integral container for shipping and transporting across the globe. But we know there's very minor minor processing after it's put into that that Aramis assembly before it goes into the final fill and finish machine. It's as close to the, the final drug product as it can possibly be in a, a concentrated drug form. So the requirements that we meet and we're able to meet for the Aramis product are, are super downstream. Um, they are as close to that, that uh, medical device that, that goes into somebody's arm without actually being a, a medical device certification. So. There are all sorts of considerations. Patients can go into anaphylactic shock if in the presence of endotoxins, right? Not allowed. We need to make sure we meet all the um, industry standards for particulates, um, for, for those types of things. And they're, they're very interested, again, in that back to the leachables and extractables profiles. So um, all those quality requirements are, are front and center in that, in that. And really what we strive to do is Although those aren't requirements for some of the, the more upstream things, anywhere where we're able to certify or anywhere where we have the material compliance information, we're, we're bringing that, that quality and compliance back upstream 
wherever possible. I'm just sitting back, putting these two pieces together. So we have a, a material or a construction, a design and physical uh, uh, benefit over our previous option for the bags. And then we also have now this increased uh, quality specification or, or materials of construction. So it just the two go really nicely together. Uh, we have a stronger bag, which we know more about. Well, one thing that I think it would make sense to, to talk a bit about is, is, you know, is Cooner's involvement in, in trade organizations as, as well as Integris's. So, um, Tibor, Dave, do you want to talk a bit about that? Yes, we have organizations also here in, uh, in Europe. And the one organization we are part of is the uh, organization DECHEMA. And DECHEMA has uh, working groups, and one working group is uh, the single use working group. And here we are a member in this working group. We focus on different things in these working groups. It's also leachables and extractables, but also, and that is for us quite important, engineering parameters. And um, so the DECHIMA group um, provides methods uh, how to determine scale up parameters in single use bioreactors. And with these methods, we are um, characterizing our orbital shaken bioreactors and we get scale up parameters like KLA value and, for example, like also mixing type. And these quite valuable uh, engineering parameters we can give to our customers then, and then it's for them quite easy to scale up from shake flask to a 2500 liter tank or, for example, to compare a steered bioreactor with our orbital shape the bioreactor because all these engineering parameters and methods, these are all standardized. I know there are also groups in the US like uh, BPOC and BPSA. Uh, Todd, can you comment on them, where the focus of these groups is? Oh, great, great point, uh, Tibor, yes. Uh, Integris recognize how important it is to not only work on developing products, but also to aid in guiding the industry as to what we should be testing against, what kind of requirements we should be meeting for the product. So I have actually personally been involved with BPSA, the Bioprocess Systems Alliance, since 2005 when it first started. And I'm on the member of the board of directors and served in various roles within BPSA. But one of the first things that BPSA tackled was around trying to get a lot of different suppliers together that manufactured bags and tube sets and filters to have some commonality of getting this new paradigm of plastics into uh, bioprocessing applications. And so that's how it, it got started, but it's continued to keep up with this ever evolving uh, requirements as they change and get more stringent and as the industry learns more about what do we need to do in order to meet the requirements of the bioprocessing uh, market uh, where it is so critical that uh, the process is their product and so mm -hmm. you don't want to have anything where the containers or reactors or anything in that process to influence um, how their product will turn out. And by working with these associations, not only BPSA, but we're also very actively involved with BPOG, we've helped guide the industry and get that, those, the end use or the biopharmaceutical companies involved with the suppliers in order to come up with the best possible path forward on making sure that we can meet these critical requirements to service this market. Oh, Todd, you mentioned uh, plastic material. For me, it would be interesting to know do you have different uh, sources for your um, raw material, which is plastic? Igor, thank you for asking that question. I'm actually going to defer to Donny with the response because he's our resident expert on, on those things. We, we have a very customer-centric uh, philosophy. And looking back at 2020, it'd be hard not to mention um, COVID-19. So our supply chain is structured in such a way that we have identified supplier partners that um, the key things that you want as a customer, you know, lead times, availability, and ease of doing business with, with those organizations. So we have structured a tiered approach to our most criti critical components, 
but also a tiered approach to our most critical suppliers for those components. So anywhere we can, we have business uh, continuity plans in place, both for our manufacturing sites, but it's also our expectation of the suppliers that we're engaging with. Not only that, but it, it, it pervades into our, our design philosophy is that we give special preference to the components that we're selecting based on those, those tiered suppliers. The, the supplier partners that we can trust, we, we, we put it out there favorably to say, you should choose these because this supplier has the best lead time availability and ease of doing business with that, with that vendor. Of course, we're, we're talking about a disposable bioreactor and environment and sustainability, that's core to our values at Cooner Shaker. And, and we're all aware in this call that we are now talking about large disposable plastics. At Cooner, we take care. Our instruments are designed with the environment in mind, as low energy as we can be. We have uh, EcoDew technology for humidity control, which uses zero cooling units. We've shifted any cooling we needed now over to Peltier. So we're trying to take steps to make our footprint minimal, but retain the quality. When plastics come up, there, there's always a concern about life cycle. Are plastics worse? than going with steel. Um, how, how do you evaluate that? And what are some of the considerations that one would have when looking at plastics versus a traditional steel bioreactor? You know, environmental consciousness is, is definitely something at the forefront of, of everybody's mind right now. And in line with one of our corporate initiatives, um, environmental sustainability is a, is, a, is a key thing that we have an obligation to, to deliver to, to the planet and to deliver to, to our customers as an organization. When looking at single use components, right, that, that, are, that are made using a, an amount of a carbon footprint, it's really important to take a look at to the total footprint. So one of the things that we've seen in the industry is you invest in these stainless steel manufacturing facilities and you don't think about how much energy it takes and, and how much purification goes into making the WIFI that's going to be turned into buffer for cleaning those, those facilities. In addition, the, the, you know, the energy to run them and the amount of, of work hours it takes to, to validate and things of that nature. It actually ends up, and studies have shown that, that the carbon footprint of single-use components is actually lower over its lifetime than having to repeatedly clean that bioreactor over and over and over. So yes, it's absolutely a concern, um, but the, the carbon footprint ends up being being lower when using single-use components um, in, in the applications we're talking about. It's the the um, flexibility, so the, the cleaning and the cycle that it takes to do that, I suppose, from, from our perspective, as so many manufacturers steel, when you build a piece of steel, it's often purpose-built for one thing. And we've seen in the recent months the collaborative effort and phenomenal collaborative effort that we're all appreciative of, of our partners, our customers coming together to produce vaccines, uh, company A's vaccine and company B's factory. And I suppose that kind of uh, product turnover and multi-product facility is almost only possible when you can have a disposable type bioreactor, which then you can replicate globally in a very short time frame. So yeah, the, the, the carbon footprint is certainly one thing, but the advantages far outstrip it. Even at the carbon footprint level, however, the energy consumption is uh, less going with plastic than it is going with steel when you look at the long run. In addition to Integra's corporate responsibility, we also, BPSA has a sustainability committee where we brought together pharmaceutical companies, as well as the suppliers to come up with best practices for uh, reducing the carbon footprint. But also we've sponsored studies so you can actually check out the, the BPSA website and it'll give you some of the specific information. Once you actually look at the scientific data and the facts, you can see that the, the use of plastics for these types of applications has less um, if not negligible effect on the environment compared to some of the traditional methods that have been used to produce these kind of products. 
Yeah, and, and you mentioned um, flexibility, but there's there's an element of, of future proofing in the adoption of, of single use technologies as well. The paradigm previously was you needed to invest capital in, in building up stainless steel for your your full scale manufacturing. And so you had a particular throughput, you're incurring depreciation and capital costs, but you're not utilizing the, the full production capability of that of that steel. So you've done all the validation, you've sunk all the cost, and in the hope for for a lower cost of goods sold through that through that stainless steel factory. The nice thing about single use capacity is that when you put single use in place, you can scale that quite rapidly. So you can push off some of the capital costs that you're incurring in that by installing um, modular single use uh, products throughout the facility. As you mentioned, that's one of the things that allowed people to rapidly scale for, for COVID manufacturing, right? This is, it wouldn't be possible to, to do that with stainless steel. You need to, to build factories. In addition to that, one of the key problems that CMOs face in the industry is you have a pipe set and you, you've designed that steel, which is rigid and it's in place and it's validated. Anytime you need to cut that steel, you've got to notify every customer about every product that's manufactured on that. If, if you're super lucky, it's a six month, likely it's, it's nine, 12, 18 month notification period before you can actually implement that change that you want to. You also have to revalidate. You have to do all your cleaning validation again, and you need to make sure that you haven't caused a problem or an interaction with one of those other products that's produced on that full scale manufacturing. By using single use, you can have different configurations of those single use assemblies for different products. Or you could even have the same configuration for those different products that are coming through your factory, but you've got no risk of cross contamination. They can't. You don't need to repeat that cleaning validation. You don't need to provide necessarily notification. If you need to, to change customer B, you don't have to tell customer A about it. So it's a really empowering thing for the industry to be able to react to situations like this. I think we're going to see more of this as, you know, we rewrite the, the pandemic response book. There's going to be more thinking about how can we take the successes we had and also how can we use those successes to eliminate maybe some of the shortcomings that, that we experienced over the last year. And I'll add to that too, Donnie, one of the, the key things that happened in this industry and why it's, it's changed is that the, the single use has gotten adopted because more of the pharmaceutical companies that wanted to keep everything under their roof in order to control the processing and the development of, of drug product and therapies was, was key. They, they needed that ownership and they were built these billion dollar facilities in order to use that for one particular drug substance. Uh, what's changed is that the, the patient populations for various things um, don't require that same level of, or they're not as effective at uh, treating as many patients. So you got to basically come up with more of the precision medicine where you're going to have a much smaller patient population. And if you were to still utilize the very large 10,000 liter and above reactors to try to service that very small market, the economies aren't there to make it happen. So what Cooner has done with with their 2,500 liter reactor is create a nice hybrid system for the industry where they can incorporate the single use and get that flexibility as as mentioned um, to do multiple runs and do it for multiple pharmaceutical companies so that they can have that flexibility that's so key in order to service the market because they don't know necessarily from um, month to month which pieces of business they're going to actually end up winning um, in, in, in what they're going to actually end up needing to service to, to do that next cure or next uh, drug therapy to, to customers. It's, it's interesting to have a conversation about a, a bioreactor and think of the total life cycle and, and how the pharmaceutical industry has changed um, and how a disposable reactor is enabling these new modalities and these multi-product facilities to really come to existence. And the, the, the way of, there's always going to be the products that need the very large production facility with 
hundreds of thousands of liters running through them in single reactors. But uh, it's also true that by having this flexibility and this scale, uh, we've reduced the footprint, we've reduced the, the environmental demand, really, and still allowed more flexibility. So less energy is going in, less uh, things are consumed in terms of, of the distilled water, the WIFI, the purified water, the steam needed to sterilize. But even while reducing all of those consumptive uh, things that our, our partners must do, uh, we've given them more flexibility. And, and so it's a really interesting story, I think, to consider when you look at sustainability with these disposables. Yeah, this, this has been a fun conversation. And coming from a company that has a long history in the market, uh, 50 years of producing machines, which are respected to be the top in the market, and then being able to partner with a company who are experts in their field, um, for, for a company such as ours to make a foray into large-scale bioreactors, to be able to, to develop internally the expertise that we're able to leverage with Integris would be impossible. It would just be impossible. So it's exciting to see our two companies come together where we have uh, two groups of experts who are nimble and really know what they're doing, be able to provide our common partner with an excellent solution for what they need to do. So uh, thank you and your team. Uh, we're really excited about this. And it's interesting, we'll be able to offer something, I think uh, we are offering something that a large company would have a tough time to deliver. It's flexibility and also the expertise. Thank you, Dave. I think that was a perfect summary. I do not have to say anything else to it. But of course, I also think everybody here in this, uh, who attended this discussion, and I think it was a very informative discussion. And to our viewers, I think you get a lot of answers to your questions. And I have to say, it's great to work, uh, work together uh, with you, uh, Todd, and your team and Integris. And uh, that is really a pleasure and also very, very uh, fruitful. And I'm looking for a long-term partnership with that. Yeah? And I also have to say thank you to Amelia. Uh, she's a lady in the background who supported us to do this interview. Yes, and also very much thank you to Amelia. Thank you, Tibor. It's been our pleasure to work with Cooner not only on this project, but with this interview um, to tackle this key challenge that's been identified. And I think the viewers really got a lot out of it as well. And I like this as the first of many challenges. I say the viewers should stay tuned. This, this is just the first of many to come that we're going to help solve a lot of the problems that our industry is facing by utilizing our expertise together. So thank you again. It's been a pleasure.